have a bomb. Disaster in the air and strike at any time. If you were caught in the left, we're nearly at zero. If we run out of fuel in mid-ocean, means death. When it leads to total engine failure, it's every pilot's worst nightmare. Mayday, mayday, mayday. It was my first time that I call a mayday. It was the first and the last. Ladies and gentlemen, we have run out of fuel and we're expecting a crash landing. People were screaming, praying. I was thinking about my family. The things that I didn't say, the things that I should have said. Landing without power is the ultimate test of skill and nerve. The plane turned on its side and we started heading straight down. Some have ended in disaster. Others have become part of aviation history. They said brace, brace, brace. And at that point, I, I threw my head in between my legs and just hoped for the best. Have any ideas? Absolutely not. This is the captain. Brace for impact. Fifteenth of January, two thousand and nine. LaGuardia, New York City. With thirty million passengers traveling through it every year, the skies around LaGuardia are among the busiest in the states. One of the people in control of that airspace is thirty-four-year-old air traffic controller Patrick Harden. He has ten years in the job. We can't have an off day. You have to come in with your A-game every day, or don't come in. Uh, there's too much on the line. Today, Patrick is in charge of the routine departure of US Airways Flight 1549, carrying 150 passengers from LaGuardia down the coast to Charlotte, North Carolina. The plane is a narrow-bodied Airbus A320. The pilot has the benefit of Airbus's computerized cockpit display and a fully digital fly-by-wire control system. That pilot is Captain Chesley Sullenberger, often known as Sully. With 42 years of experience and nearly 20,000 hours of flying, he's more than a safe pair of hands. Captain Sullenberger plays by the book. We got to know each other somewhat on a personal level, you know, children, families. We were all working off the same page. Next to Sully is co-pilot First Officer Jeffrey Skiles. Sheila Dale is in charge of the cabin. It's the end of a four-day shift for the team, and this is their last flight before heading home. Many of the passengers are regulars, commuting home after a busy week in the city. Businessman Barry Leonard catches the same flight every Thursday. I did it every week. I flew to New York on Monday mornings and flew back home on the 245 flight, flight 1549. But today is special. Barry's wife has just been given the all clear from cancer, and Barry has been desperate with worry. I remember I prayed to God, if you're gonna take anybody, take me. And I got a phone call right after that from the doctor's office and she was fine. It's just the best news. I was just so happy that she was okay. Sir, your phone, please. Thank you. I love you. All right, bye-bye. Set. At 3.25 p.m., the aircraft takes off with First Officer Skiles at the controls. You're up. Once they leave the ground, that's when they switch them over to the departure controller, which is what I was that day. I radar identify them, so I see them on my scope, and then climb them up to the highest altitude I can. In this case, it was 15,000. Get this 5049 New York departure radar control. Plan and maintain 15,000. Maintain 15,000. Cactus 1549. The crisp, clear January afternoon affords a spectacular view of the New York skyline. Ah, what a view of the Hudson today. 
Pignier. The passengers settle in for what would normally be a two-hour flight. But today, the journey will last under six minutes. 95 seconds in, passenger Eric Stevenson sees something in the sky that grabs his attention. All of a sudden, I saw a, what seemed to be a gray cloud just move very quickly. Moments later, the mysterious moving cloud collides with the plane. It was just a thumping sound. The plane shuddered a bit. Everyone was a bit startled. You, you felt the, the plane vibrate a bit. I leaned over to my coworker, Donna, and I whispered, what was that? It was a bird strike. And she whispered back to me, I think it was a bird strike. Then I remember smelling something, and I thought it was an electrical fire. The cabin smelled like burnt chicken. But the smell is just the start of their problems. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Not one rolling back. Most of the flock hit the nose and wings. But critically, seven birds have flown directly into the plane's engines. We got both of them rolling back. Both engines have been terminally damaged. Ignition start. The U.S. Air Race crew would have recognized the seriousness of the situation very quickly, realized on their instrument gauges that they were losing thrust in the engines, so the airplane would begin to pitch down, as well as a decrease in engine noise. In the cabin, passengers know something is wrong. All of a sudden, I started hearing this noise, and it was like, choo, 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 choo. and I was like, God, what is that? What is that sound? It sounds like tennis shoes rolling around in a dryer. After 30 years of flying, you try to analyze what could that be. I just thought we had mechanical problems and that the pilots would be speaking to go back to the airport to deal with what the issue was. My thought was, when we get back, it might take a while to fix it, so, you know, hopefully we will get home tonight. The situation quickly deteriorates. Behind me, people seemed a bit agitated. To them, something was terribly wrong. They actually saw fire coming out of the engines. Without engines, there's no power. 3,000 feet above one of the most densely populated cities in the world, Sully is in charge of a plane without controls. But he doesn't panic. Start the APU. Captain Sullenberger starts the auxiliary power unit a small jet engine in the tail that restores basic flight controls. Next, he takes control of the plane. My aircraft. Your aircraft. That transfer of control was done exactly as it should have been. Without power to provide thrust, Sully's first priority is to stop the plane falling out of the sky. So he lowers the nose to prevent it from stalling. Next, he checks the altitude and sets the optimum speed for the plane to glide for as long as possible. You don't want to go below that speed until you can get an engine restarted so that you can return back to LaGuardia. That's the initial thinking. Get the QRH, lost the thrust in both engines. The QRH, or Quick Reference Handbook, provides instructions for how to restart an engine. Ignition. They knew that they needed to get an engine restarted. So First Officer Skiles, very experienced aviator, and that was exactly what he was doing with both the left and right engine, trying to get the proper sequence of airflow, fuel, and ignition to get the engine to run again. But nothing works. What they didn't know and what was so rare was that the core of the engine was so badly damaged that it couldn't really run. Now, just 21 seconds after the bird strike, the plane is losing height at the rate of over 1,000 feet per minute and descending ominously toward the Bronx. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is Cactus 1549. Hit birds. Lost thrust in both engines. We're turning back towards the guard here. Controller Patrick Harton recalls Sully's incredible calm. OK, yeah, you need to return to the Guardia. Turn left, heading of uh, 220. 220. The severity in the situation hit me right away. He's telling me he lost thrust in both engines, but he's saying it like, oh, you know, he's lost thrust in both engines. The words told me how severe it was. His tone did it. 
So we have an emergency both engines gone, no thrust. Like Sully, Harton has never had to deal with a plane without power. But he knows instinctively with every second that passes, the aircraft is losing valuable height. Harton clears the airspace so the US Airways flight has freedom to land wherever it can at LaGuardia. You don't want someone arriving on the same runway that he might potentially land on. So that freed up the runway for him. Kansas 1549, if we can get it for you, do you want to try and land runway 13? I could feel my heart pounding outside my chest. It was just beating so hard. I just felt hyper-focused, and I think that's the way that I was just able to suppress everything else is, and try to find the right solution. Sully knows if they can get to LaGuardia, they have a chance. Landing without power is fraught with danger, but there is a glimmer of hope. A plane has landed successfully without engines before. Thursday, the 23rd of August, 2001, Toronto. It's peak holiday season, and Air Transit Flight 236 is taking 306 passengers and crew to Lisbon, Portugal. The passengers are mostly Canadians heading off on holiday, or Portuguese returning home. I was really looking forward to this trip. Going home is always wonderful. It's such a beautiful country. I'm always excited to return. It was my first time in Europe in a long time. I was excited. I was expecting a lot of partying, a lot of uh, uh, beaches, uh, good food. It was purely just go and have a good time. The plane is piloted by Captain Robert Pichet. He's been flying since a teenager and has over 16,000 hours flight experience. In the right-hand seat, with nearly 5,000 hours, is his first officer, Dirk de Jager. 8.52 p.m., the flight takes off carrying 47 tons of fuel, more than enough to make the flight four times over. But today, the Atlantic crossing is particularly busy, so Captain Pichet receives a request from air traffic control to divert 60 miles south. I said yes. I just look at my computer routing, you know, and I was losing a few minutes on the flight plan, which few minutes of fuel. It's uh, really uh, negligible, you know, and I said yes. The captain has no idea that this small diversion will make the difference between life and death. Five oh three a.m. Halfway across the Atlantic, the crew noticed something unusual about the right engine. The oil temperature is low and the pressure high. There's nothing in the QRH. Neither pilot has seen this combination before, so they radio maintenance in Quebec for advice. Transact 236 to Mirabelle Operations. We have a warning come up. The ground crew are equally unsure what it means. They couldn't figure out what was causing it because they didn't see any performance degradation of the engines itself. So they continued to fly not knowing that there was anything wrong. Half an hour later, the computer warns there's significantly less fuel in the right wing tank than the left. Whatever the fuel problem is, it's not the kind of problem that we want to have in mid-ocean. The back in my mind was saying to myself, you know, I hope it's not a big problem because if we run out of fuel in mid-ocean, it means death. To rebound these tanks, open the cross feet valve. Let's try that. Pass swing, fit on. Pilots start the procedure to balance the fuel tanks. They open the cross-feed valve, allowing fuel from the left wing to feed the right engine. But little did they know, there's a leak in the line. Opening the cross-feed valve is the worst thing the pilots could do, because valuable fuel is now being lost from the left tank. The crew fly on, oblivious to the fact that the plane is losing fuel at the rate of a gallon per second. It takes 10 minutes before First Officer De Jager notices the fuel loss is accelerating. The fuel levels are still going down too fast. Are you sure? Check again. That's the worst nightmare of a pilot, to get a massive fuel leak over the ocean. I didn't want to go through that nightmare, but that's what I was having, you know, a nightmare that night. 
Correctly suspecting a leak, Pichet asks a flight attendant to visually check the right wing. In the darkness, they can't see the thin ribbon of fuel, hundreds of miles long, trailing behind the right wing. There was really no possibility for them to see the misting fuel that was being pumped overboard by this very high pressure engine pump. We're still losing fuel. We have eight tons less than we should have. The situation is critical. Pichet has to act fast. When Dirk the Jagger, the first officer, told me that we had uh, eight tons of fuel less than we were supposed to have. I said to myself, we're going to our alternate airport. OK, we have to divert. Where's the nearest airport? Pichet can't risk flying all the way to Portugal, so he turns west to the nearest runway, 200 miles away, at La Jez Air Base on Tessera Island. It's their only hope. It isn't until dawn that the passengers realize something has changed. I'd done this flight many times before, and I realized that the sun was not in front of us. The sun was actually behind us, which doesn't make sense because we're traveling east. Early in the morning, the sun is coming up in front of you, not behind you. At 6.13 a.m., Pichet's worst nightmare becomes a reality. Mayday, 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 trans 236 Santa Maria Control. It was my first time that I call a mayday. It was the first and the last. The passengers remain unaware of the impending danger. Everything seemed normal until a few moments later, I saw the flight attendant appear literally two feet in front of me with a life vest. And the look on her face was very serious. Very quickly, everything changed. Everybody needs to put their life jackets on now! As the cabin prepares for an emergency landing, the remaining fuel runs out. We've lost number one engine. My heart stopped. And I can tell you as a pilot and as a human being, to see a fuel gauge read zero, it's a pretty bad feeling to see. The plane's control systems start to power down. In the cabin, the electrics fail. As she was giving out her instructions, the intercom started to break up. And she literally just threw the intercom down and started yelling the instructions through the cabin. The fear on their faces was really shocking. They absolutely knew more than us of what was happening at that moment. Obviously, we, we did what we were told, uh, put our life jackets on, and uh, my flight attendant, he was crying. He was terrified, as we all were. At 34,000 feet, the air transit flight is out of fuel, and Tessera Island is still 62 miles away. You are gliding like a pure glider, with 306 people on board, including yourself. And you know in 10 minutes when you're going to hit the, the water, you're going to die. That's a uh, pretty bad feeling to have. Like Sully's plane, the air transit craft has been reduced to a giant glider. The plane is losing height at the rate of 1,500 feet per minute, and Tessera Island is still nowhere in sight. No one wants to land in the ocean. I've seen a few ditching happen, and the amount of survivors, you know, it's pretty, pretty low, eh? I mean, possibility of surviving a, a ditch, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, small, eh? Ditching in water was zero chance of survival for me. I, I, I don't know how to swim. I thought for sure this was it, this was over, I was gonna drown, the plane was gonna crash, am I gonna die at impact? When I was preparing to die, I was thinking about my family. I was thinking about the things that I didn't say, the things that I should have said, things of that nature. As Captain Pichet mentally steals himself for ditching, land appears. Since the plane was 
doing pretty good. I said to myself, well, I guess I'm, I'm, go I'm gonna be able to get to the island and attempt a, a landing on the, on the runway. But Pichet is still facing the ultimate test of airmanship. The craft is flying too high and too fast. Without power, he must somehow slow the plane to land safely. He was coming down faster than he would have done in a, in a normal a routine landing. So he had to end up slowing up the aircraft by doing a series of S-turns, just like you would do skiing. The aircraft was going up and down and kind of at a 45 degree angle and would drop every so often. The pilot made a really, really, really steep left turn. The wing on the right went up so far that I really thought we were going to tip over. I could feel the aircraft shaking because the turn was so steep. The Airbus approaches the runway at 200 knots, well above the recommended speed. They said, brace, brace, brace. And at that point, I, I threw my head in between my legs and uh, just hoped for the best. After 19 minutes without fuel, the aircraft hits the runway way too fast. We landed hard. It was really, really, really hard. We kiss off 30 feet in the air, and we'll move forward 2,000 feet. So we, there was a big jump, right? Eh? I really thought that we were going to break apart and that the underneath was just going to come pop right, right straight through us, and, and that would be it. My main concern was that I had to stop the plane before the end because you got the water. But this time, fate works in their favor. Of all the places to land, the runway at Tessera has been extended to allow space shuttles to return. With the tires blown and the landing gear in danger of collapse, the plane eventually grinds to a halt. It's all over. So I give a high five to my first officer. Kind of, uh, we're alive, you know? Everybody is alive. The plane is, is not that much broken. So, you know, we, we're lucky enough that uh, we step on the runway. All 306 on board survived the impact, nursing minor injuries. The crew are heralded as heroes. The fact that we had Captain Pichet as our leader was a miracle. The pressure that he was under, for him to do what he did when he had to do it, it's, he's a hero. You don't have time really to think about anything else than taking care of the, of the safety of your passenger, you know? That's your main goal. Captain Pichet breaks the world record for the longest glide of a commercial plane in history. The 19 minutes that I glided in seems to me 19 seconds, and sometimes it seems 19 hours. But if Pichet hadn't accepted the diversion to his intended flight plan, the craft would never have reached to Sarah. Captain Pichet shows it's possible to land safely without power, provided the aircraft has enough altitude and time to glide to a runway. Above New York City, a US Airways craft has lost both engines after a bird strike. If Captain Sully can reach an airport, there's hope. But the disaster struck at only 2,800 feet above the city, and there's less than three minutes flying time. He needed to make a decision very quickly, and he knew that if he made the wrong decision, that the result could be disastrous. Air controller Patrick Harton has done everything he can, clearing the airspace and the runways at LaGuardia giving Sully every possible option. He catches 1549, it's gonna be left traffic for runway 31. The plane is too low. Sully breaks the news. We are unable. They might have made it, but the consequences of being short would have been catastrophic. It's over to our right, anything in New Jersey, uh, maybe Teterboro? Okay, yeah, on your right side is Teterboro Airport. You wanna try and go to Teterboro? Yes. 
So he had asked me, what about Teterboro? And it's not my job to ask him, why would you choose this over another? You tell me what you need and I'm going to make it happen. Teterboro Town need a runway. Kansas 15 for you now. needs to go to the runway right now. Sully's mind races, factoring distance, airspeed, and altitude. Is Teterboro really an option? Based on the sink rate, they were not going to be able to get back there. Texas 1549, turn right, 280. You can land runway one at Teterboro. Unable. OK, which runway would you like at Teterboro? Just 137 seconds after the bird strike, Captain Sully makes the biggest call of his life. We're going to be in the Hudson. Harden can't take it in. I'm sorry, say again, Texas. Heard the words. I did not process words, because in my mind, that really wasn't an option. I've worked a lot of emergencies. Our job is to get them back to the airport. Always done it successfully. I never assumed anything else would happen. This was the first time that there was actual real possibility that he might not make it to the runway. So that wasn't something that I wasn't willing to accept, I guess. And that's probably why I didn't really consciously process the we may be in the Hudson part. Because history suggests that ditching in water ends in disaster. Twenty third of November, nineteen ninety six. Ethiopian Airlines Flight nine six one prepares to fly one hundred and sixty three passengers and twelve crew from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to Nairobi, Kenya. Michael Adenio has just finished a business trip. He's flying home a day early to travel with a friend and his family. I was happy. We were all traveling together, my friend and his kids. We tried to get seating together, but that was not possible. Captain Leo Labata and First Officer Jonas Mercuria safely get the Boeing 767 into the air. 20 minutes into the flight, the piece is shattered. I heard a sound from the back. There's a guy running, pushing the air hostesses out of the way and shouting. This is a hijack! This is a hijack! Three hijackers threatened to detonate a bomb. They had no choice but to believe what they were saying. They had something wrapped in a bag around one of their hands, which could have been a grenade. I don't think anybody was willing to, to doubt them or to try them because they looked really um, agitated. They just looked menacing. They break into the cockpit and beat First Officer Curia. There's 11 of us. We have a bomb. Now take us to Australia. Don't move. I kill you. We don't have enough fuel to fly to Australia. You are a liar. I can't think of any more stressful a situation than to have a hijacker on board and saying that he had eight more perpetrators in the back, threatening to blow up the airplane. As terrifying as it seems, hijacks were quite common in Ethiopia and usually ended without incident. I thought we'd probably land at an airport and the hijackers would negotiate with the authorities, make their demands, and then hopefully we would be released. In those days before September 11th, you listened to what the hijackers were telling you because they weren't trying to kill you. They were just trying to take the airplane to a place they wanted to go. So I think no one really wanted to get out of their seats. They believed that the perpetrators had bombs and they believed that there would be a safe landing. In fact, the hijackers are bluffing. There were no other perpetrators. There was no bomb. As the hours went on, they started to drink, and they had a bottle of whiskey. So I presume after some time, they must have been intoxicated. Just keep flying. As the hijackers lose concentration, Captain Abata seizes the moment and steers the plane toward a runway on the Comoros Islands. The plan almost works, but just minutes from landing, the low fuel warning comes on as the left engines flame out. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your pilot. We have run out of fuel and we are losing one engine at this time. We're expecting a crash landing. While the passengers panic and prepare for a water ditching, 
In the cockpit, the intoxicated hijacker thinks they're being tricked. When the pilot was actually in a critical phase of landing, the hijacker started beating up the pilot while he was in the chair, uh, still trying to steer the airplane. During the struggle, the autopilot is turned off. As Captain Abata struggles to regain control, the second engine fails. I can't think of anything worse than to be out of power uh, and not necessarily knowing what you're going to do or where you're going. Abata has no choice but to ditch the plane in the ocean. He tries to steer as close to the shore as possible while slowing the plane down. Ditching a jet is a very hazardous undertaking. You need to get the airplane at the slowest possible speed and to enter the water in a controlled way. The engines are underneath the wing. If you catch those engines at the front, it's going to tend to drive the nose into the water. So you want to try to keep the nose up as long as possible so that you don't catch the leading edge of the engines in the water. I thought, of course, of my daughter, who was only one and a half years old then, and my wife. I didn't know anybody who had survived a plane crash, so I didn't really think there was much of a chance. Except if I was not injured on impact, I would definitely get out of that wreck because I'd have been able to swim out. I felt that was a little too early for me to exit uh, the world. Moments before impact, Abata turns left in an attempt to land parallel with the waves. But the left wing catches the water, causing the plane to cartwheel and break apart. Tourists on a nearby beach capture the horrific moment on camera. The plane hit the ocean, and within a few seconds, it actually broke into pieces. The tail end came off, the cockpit came off, and we were in the middle. I turned around and swam on my back, and I could see light at the end where the tail end had broken off. So I instinctively decided to swim towards that light. I looked up into the sky and I thought, okay, is this heaven or where is this? And when I leveled out and saw the coastline, I said, yeah, I think I'm still around, I'm still on Earth. Around me, though, there were floating bodies, some with very serious injuries, and uh, it was not a very good sight. Captain Abata is one of the 50 to survive the water ditching. 125 people die. None of the hijackers live to face justice. I think it's really sad that it's usually innocent people who have nothing to do with the issues that suffer so much. For me personally, a friend I was traveling with and his children all passed away. So over and above going through all this trauma of the hijacking, we had to come home and bury my friend and his children. Uh, so it was, it was terrible. It was something that uh, always haunts me to this day. 13 years later, over New York City, a bird strike has killed Captain Sully's plane's engines. Without power and falling fast, he now faces the same challenge as Captain Abata and must attempt to ditch on water. We're going to be in the Hudson. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus. Controller Harton struggles to digest the situation. Did Sully really say he was ditching in the Hudson? You once have got Newark Airport off your two o'clock in about seven miles. To me, it was like a death sentence. And I just thought that, like the Ethiopian flight, a wingtip touches the water, starts doing cartwheels, and it's just not good. My mind kind of wanted to block it out because that was the moment that we didn't win. We didn't get this guy to the, the airport. Texas 1549, you still on? 
but Captain Sully doesn't respond. He is concentrating on avoiding the fate of the Ethiopian airliner. It's critical Sully keeps the wings level and ditches as slowly as possible. Normally, the landing gear helps slow a plane, but when wheels catch on water, the plane is thrown into a catastrophic spin. Sully's only option is to increase air friction by lifting the nose, but it has to be pitched perfectly. He now has only seconds to prepare for ditching. The passengers realize the seriousness of what they're facing. I could see the tops of the buildings and then realize that we were below the tops of the building. So I knew that we were still going down. I knew we were in the middle of the Hudson. At that point, you knew that we weren't landing at an airport. We're going to crash, and I just, gonna, I just want to say before I die, and it's I love bad. you. And, and I I'm love sorry. you. I love you so much. All of a sudden, the plane picked up a little bit. And then the captain came on and said, This is the captain. Brace for impact. There was not a bit of concern in his voice. He was so calm. And it obviously made me and I think everyone else on board feel like he had this 100% under control. Brace, brace, brace. Head down. Stay down. I just remember how halting that chant was. Head down, stay down. For 30 years, I had heard those words, but I had heard them in a training situation. Brace for impact over a populated area is nothing, uh, you know, a flight attendant wants to hear. Brace, head down, and stay down. Texas 1549, if you can. One way two nines available in Newark. It'll be your two o'clock and seven miles. As the plane descends below the buildings, it drops off radar. There was no more communications between him and I. Following ATC protocol, Harton is escorted to a quiet room to make a written statement. No TV, internet, or news. Harton has no way of knowing what happens to US Airways Flight 1549. I thought, wow, I just worked the biggest aviation accident in modern history. Like, how do you deal with that? Brace, brace, brace. But Harton hadn't reckoned on the ice cool head of Captain Sully. Flaps to two, you want more? No, let's keep it at two. Got any ideas? Actually, not. As Captain Sully approaches the river, he keeps the nose up and the wings level. Brace! 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 Head down! Stay down! Brace! 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 Head down! The plane hits the Hudson. The plane, when it hit the water, groaned. It was like, whoa. We were still in one piece. We weren't on fire. So even though it was a very hard landing, I was feeling positive that we might get out of this. We actually survived this plane crash. It was amazing that that happened. The landing was just about textbook. They were wings level. They were at the slowest possible speed. They were able to minimize the descent rate right at touchdown. And so the first part that touched was the tail, which kept the engines out of the water a little bit longer. And it was a good combination of crew skill and the, and the, uh, the airplane. With the aircraft in one piece, it floats on the Hudson like a boat. But no one knows how long that will last. I remember the captain coming out and saying, evacuate. Ladies and gentlemen, calmly evacuate. Stay calm, please. Stay calm, please. The situation in the cabin was controlled chaos, and I continue to have these feelings. Things are working well for us. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Gentlemen, please stay calm. Orderly fashion, out on the wing. Now it's the cabin crew's turn to put their training into action. The last person inside is Captain Sully, checking no one has been left behind. Passengers wait on the wings to be saved. Over at ATC, Harton is totally unaware of the miracle that has just taken place on the Hudson. You're sitting there within your own thoughts. They're not great thoughts. They're terrible. And it's a life-changing event. And it's a, a flight that 155 people died in. And they're going to sit there and they're going to analyze everything you did. And you're going to have this self-doubt. Did I do something wrong? Could I have done something different? And these are the things that are going through my mind. Like, how am I going to handle this? You know, so it, was, it wasn't easy. In the chaos of the rescue operation, his colleagues completely forget that he is still in the dark. Patty, Patty. It looks like they all survived. It took 45 minutes for them to realize that someone should come down and tell me, you know, that there were survivors. <laughs> I didn't believe him at first. But when I finally did realize that was the truth, it, it, I felt like the weight of the world was taken off my shoulders. The landing on the Hudson becomes part of aviation history. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Despite the successful landing, the National Transportation Safety Board investigate if there are any lessons to be learned. I was uh, responsible for calling the first um, investigative hearing, and I got to meet Sully at that time. And it's nothing like uh, the depiction, if you will, of what you may have seen in the motion pictures. We were highly respectful. Did Captain Sullenberger make the right decision to ditch? Investigators rerun the flight in simulators. If he'd taken the chance, could Sully have reached a runway? Was it feasible to make it back to the airport? if you knew that you were going to have to do it, and that was only successful half of the time. Then we said, OK, now let's take into consideration the decision-making process that the flight crew would have gone through. From bird strike to ditching on the Hudson, the pilots had to start the auxiliary power unit, starting the APU, adjust the altitude for maximum glide speed, with QRH, check the handbook, try to restart the engines, calculate if there was time to reach an airport, all before Sully made his decision. You're going to be in the Hudson. These aren't machines that we're talking about that can just respond immediately, who can do calculations in a blink of an eye. These are people who have to go through a thoughtful process in order to make a decision, um, in order to save the lives of everybody on board. When the investigators factor in thinking time, the result is emphatic. We did a 35-second delay and then attempted to land at LaGuardia, and that attempt was not successful. The conclusion is that Captain Sullenberger made the right decision. Had Captain Sullenberger attempted to land at LaGuardia or Teterboro or not landed at a wings-level attitude on the Hudson River, this accident could have been much different. We could have lost all of the lives on this airplane. We came along and it survived something that most people the day before would have said that's not survivable. And, and we all did. <laughs>